the session will be moderated by Mr. Piyush Gupta, uh, who's the MD Capital Markets and Investments uh, Investment Services with uh, Colliers International India. Uh, well, I will invite uh, Mr. Dutt to uh, formally take over the session, do a formal welcome for all the speakers, and I hope you find the today's session very meaningful and interactive. Mr. Dutt, over to you. Sachin, I don't think you can hear us. Sachin? He's there online. But he cannot hear us because I've asked him to speak and he's not there. Ha, huh. there you are. Very good afternoon. How are you? Very well. Uh, I just uh, informally welcomed and left it to you to formally welcome all the speakers no, and no. take over the session and moderate the session. No, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for connecting. I think we've had many webinars over the last few months. Some may say because of containment, we had no choice. But I think it's an opportunity for us to use this time to reflect on what we have gone through and also what we know lies ahead of us. And therefore, many a times, one is kind of confined to your own style of thinking and thought process. But I think opportunities like this uh, enable us to learn from each other and uh, spark some ideas which can potentially benefit all the stakeholders and businesses. And what, what I found very uh, satisfying, uh, which it's not that the government was not very proactive, but uh, these circumstances have actually made uh, the government uh, be more alert. And I think FIKI as a body provides that opportunity to, to all of us to race. Uh, very recently, uh, I went online with some of the colleagues from the industry that how we can make this industry uh, better. For example, a uh, lot of our customers have also gone through some hardship. And uh, one thought process came that how about making the loan portability for them easy and also some of the bank processing charges, which sometimes takes time and it costly and one does cost benefit analysis. Uh, if we were to open that door, it will just make the whole process very transparent and customers will have a natural choice to choose, uh, you know, a bank or an NBFC to actually go for loan. And I think that little bit of healthy competition will enable uh, our customers to get the best of the market. Uh, and we know many institutes are actually offering a very low interest and they're very keen to grow their book and, and therefore why not uh, some benefits can be passed on. So ideas like this actually keep coming. So I'm really grateful, uh, Nirja, for, for this opportunity and putting this together. I think we can have uh, initially uh, to kickstart some uh, uh, high level developers perspective. Uh, the objective is to how do we unlock uh, some potential that we see still in the sector. Uh, I clearly see it. I can tell you about uh, Tata Realty and Tata Housing. All our 20 construction sites have gone live. We are back to full construction. I know some of our other colleagues on the webinar and outside of this webinar uh, have also commenced. Uh, the most simple step without getting into complicated strategy discussions is to how do we bring back what we were doing before COVID? So if we just do that, I think that would be a huge contribution from all of us. Uh, and that's what we are doing. Uh, we started coming to office. We started uh, doing all our work business as usual. Other than sales being little down, all our commercial portfolio, rental income is coming on time. Staff is working excellently. All our business processes are on track. Our communication is on time good. Uh, only a sense of camaraderie in the office and culture is missing which I think we're trying to adapt and create. So I'll, I'll get started uh, with Mr. Gitamar Anand. So thank you very much uh, for joining. Thank and you. Therefore, thank you. And also Gitamar, with you, a lot of energy comes along. Uh -huh. Thank you. You know, it's an afternoon session. So I would like to trigger some uh, uh, adrenaline in everybody's mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, what has been your observations in last, uh, I would say a month, I know no point talking about last three months because it's mostly not so encouraging. But uh, now, uh, one, we've seen, uh, at least I've seen, South is doing very well. 
uh, I know Mumbai and NCR are struggling, and we have Vinamra here from Capital Land who, who actually lives in Bangalore. We can reach out to him as well. But in terms of COVID, uh, I think a lot of markets are opening up. I saw some data points in the newspaper on automobile and some others. Uh, little early to conclude, but if we are getting some signs, which means six months down the road, uh, I'm sure things will be dramatically normal. Uh, so, Gitamba, first to you, and then I'll quickly come to Vinamra if that's okay. I'm giving you heads up uh, well in time to structure your thoughts. Gitamba, thank you, over. Sanjit. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So, uh, see, after the lockdown opened, Sanjay, there was a great uh, enthusiasm in everybody. Okay, now things are back to normal. And people did start going to office. And But, you know, unfortunately, this problem, this uh, contagion is such that it's coming back, you know, in spurts. And whenever yeah. it comes back now, UP is locked down for two days. So there's no continuity in the work uh, process. Yeah. That being said, so what is happening is, so, so my customers also, you know, he's still or she's still not confident that they should go on and make that purchase. Hmm. That being said, what has changed in the last month is the view of the courts, the view of the bankers. Hmm. You know, I will give you an analogy. So recession is a pit. And yes. in this pit, India, of course, it's been said by the RBI that we are entering a recessionary mode. So we, all of us as businessmen, as entrepreneurs and bankers and everybody, all stakeholders are now in a pit which is at a minus 4.5 or minus 5. Yes. To give you an analogy, let's look at us as people who are stuck in that pit. And to get out of the pit, there are two ways. One is the stronger ones can use the weaker ones, st stamp over them, stomp over them and get out of the pit. And the other way is, and when they get out, when the stronger ones get out of the pit, the weaker ones are still weaker ones. When I say weak and strong, I'm saying ones who are today uh, strong in their uh, businesses, or let's say, I, I would say the bankers are the strong ones today. Yes. So, so the stakeholders who are left behind are the real estate developers and, you know, people who are the work, <coughs> the people who are working on ground. So if the bankers do emerge out of the pit by ignoring other stakeholders and say, okay, we are out of it now, they will mm -hmm. not survive once they're out because it is a complementary relationship we have. Obviously. Till, till we are not there to work for them, they will not really survive. Mm -hmm. The other way to get out of it is that the stronger ones form a base at the bottom of the pit to let the weaker ones get out first. So today, what I'm trying to say here is that we need support from the financial institutions. We need support from the funds. We need support from any and everybody who can actually and has lent money to real estate. Hmm. Uh, the practical problem on ground, Sanjay, and I'm talking about, I'm talking for most of the developers, the small, medium and the large ones. Practical problem on ground is liquidity. There is a liquidity a shortage of liquidity. It always was there before COVID also, but now it's just become worse because the customer has also stopped paying. So we've been, you know it well, and we fought together with yes, the government yes. and we told them, give, give some sort of liquidity as you've given to the MSME sectors. Going to office... I mean, how will we continue without money? Going, starting projects, getting labor back, how will we continue without money? So that some trigger, some money to trigger yeah. the process of construction on site is required. And, you know, corporates are different in that uh, sense because you have a balance sheet, you can take money out of there and you can, you know, fund uh, any immediate requirement. But for 99% uh, of the developer community, access to this em emergency capital today is actually yeah. impossible to come by. Now, and I was, you know, speaking in Ministry of Finance to Secretary Banking also, and they are an Amitabh Kanji se bhi baat hui meri. They are saying, okay, fine, if a project is looking at, you know, is doing a PMAY product, you know, where 210 yes. square meter carpet area, then we can come up with some formula where the RBI provides some TLTRO to the NBFCs and of course PSUs have money in under anyway. And provide and liquidity will, through that route. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they'll, they can come up with some formula where uh, an emergency line of funding, maybe 10 or uh, 15 or 20 percent of your sanctioned line, mm -hmm. is extended to you for this COVID situation. Because it's, Which is not bad. Uh, yeah. I think and if the government starts that, Kitambar, then I think uh, let's pehle ye to pakar lete. Ah, bilkul sahi baat. <laughs> so, or dusi jo aapse, or last panel discussion, I have ah. note note diya hai. Hamara 
सिक्योरिटीज है इसलिए वो खरीद लोन टूडे विल आई बी एबल टू सर्विस माई ई एम आई maybe next month next 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 month and i'm talking about under construction properties also sure. so sure. in that scenario if my hfc can give us subvention for 24 months where my home buyer gets a job security and there are models where we can we can as we go along we'll i'll discuss that model if that security comes from the hfc rather from the developer because the developer has got no liquidity to subvent a purchase today. i don't have the cash flow to give subventions so therefore sure. if the hfc comes up with a product wherein they subvent the home buyer's emi for 2 years or just the interest don't charge him emi it can be like a stepped up finance you know so if they can do something like that then of course you will have more courage in the home buyer to come and put down that deposit so these two things that they have done they will immediately kick start liquidity in a sector which already has been starved so let me step back uh, so this is on the residential side yeah and i'm just uh, mindful because it gives me an opportunity to put a little positive vibe in the market through commercial ah. so commercial as you know gitambar is a very organized sector yeah you have india's top developers correct uh, controlling 650 million square feet and i am very fortunate that uh, i am in touch with at least a small group which controls 350 million square feet and we talk every fortnight okay. uh, and general message that i am getting is they are collecting 98% 99% of the rent on time so no problem there they could be some small uh, companies who may be going through a little bit of pain so that's one second i heard the india second read is going to go live wow. in a very short distance from now and as you know the india's first read is doing very well so i will quickly uh, you know take uh, vinamra's help uh, to discuss on office uh then we can you know talk about some other areas which may actually be worth deliberating so vinamra over to you i will right. just Thanks, step sir. in for i will yes. just step in for a minute uh piyush you can you can moderate the session with sanjay wherever you need to ask something please be sure. free no no, no yes. absolutely i think sanjay yeah so, absolutely uh, so piyush just to so i will uh, step back after this and you take it yes. forward please yes no 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 sure sure absolutely no problem yes vinamra vinamra over to you thanks thanks sanjay i think uh, you're right commercial is uh, comparatively still the brighter spot um, in the market but so here's what we are seeing um, on the construction side as you said all our sites are open but uh, what is still not uncertain is the uh, certainty of ramp up of labor uh, even though it's much better than where we were two months back it is continuing to get better but uh, with recently for example what's happening in bangalore i mean uh, couple of week last weekend i think there was a huge traffic jam for people trying to get out of bangalore yes. and 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 such news you know as you can expect a lot of times from a perception perspective is not so good for the for the workers on the ground uh, so there could be times of reverse panic again and trying to go back so so i think that ramp up is increasing slowly uh in all honesty our sense is that uh it could take up till probably diwali till we see the 100% ramp up really back on site i mean uh, we are working with like four of the largest main contractors in the country today and mm. they all keep submitting us plans to them every week every fortnight and that is the sense we are getting but the good thing is that at least they are able to give us a plan because yeah. they have confidence that they'll be able to ramp up the labor one month back they were selling us sorry don't ask for plans because we don't know where can i get my labor sure. from so sure. i think that is quite positive uh, and and you can at least uh, you know kick start your projects at different phases etc based on that so that's on the construction side now on the occupier side you are right the months of april uh, april and may um, were in a sense the worst in terms of the um, timeliness of collections but very glad to see that all the collections have come through uh, you're right the percentage is 98 99% uh, and those small ones which haven't were the ones which anyways were not going to be sustainable and that's a natural churn that keeps happening in the portfolio all the time anyways right mm. what we are seeing in the market is uh, over the last 2 3 months uh, there was just a uh, dead silence uh, you would know sanjay uh, no movement at all of any rfp etc but in the last i would say 2 weeks or so uh we are having site visits in bangalore in gurgaon in pune i've had at least three Very cities good. where my teams have had site visits of uh, occupiers i mean bangalore was already in the papers as well so the big tech firms are on the lookout for spaces so we are beginning to see some movement on some of those rfps which were just silent 
even though the travel restriction of the ultimate decision maker of some of those guys still hold true but they have started talking again they said okay you know what let's let's work on the commercials let's look at the other things uh, so not saying that decision making will will fast track but at least there is movement and i think that is a positive sign Really? lastly lastly in terms of what's happening in in the offices in the parks and that i would say is still worrying because uh, we don't see much physical occupancy still the number is still in single digit percentage points 5 to 10% is the yes. max occupancy physically that we are seeing in all our parks and pretty much every day i talk to some of our large customers and what they are saying is that uh, unless things improve in the cities even though the parks uh, like us are putting in all the world class measures which they are appreciative but they're saying that the employees are still a bit scared to get mm-hmm. out and and we don't want to push them so so there is not much certainty on how the physical occupancy will ramp up unless something drastic changes on the ground and and especially for a city like bangalore what's been happening the last two weeks is not encouraging at all uh, so so that's a situation on the ground in the parks so just to summarize before piyush takes over uh, so leasing activity may be slow but is returning uh, i think in residential i was talking to samir of prog equity and he was saying 35% demand in comparison to last year and uh, doing better in affordable and if we were to compare uh, the profile of the developers who have access to capital so commercial is reasonably comfortable and the reputed corporate developers or reputed local developers on the residential side who have access to capital most of them have started work but there are the legacy projects and some tier 2 tier 3 developers who need liquidity and that's what gitambar was uh, alluding to and therefore a lot more help required so from unlocking the value point of view uh, i will let uh, piyush to stare the rest of the discussion piyush yeah. thank you thank thank thanks sanjay uh, so starting with the point uh, which you know gitambar uh, made out on the liquidity i think which the sector has been waiting for a long long time so uh, anira your views uh, you know nbfcs and hfcs have been the biggest lenders to real estate for last 5 6 years having put more than 2 lakh crore now and we know quite a few of them are no more investing or in fact withdrawing capital now in this scenario what what uh, role do you think uh, like hfcs and nbfcs like yours will want to take uh, in investing uh, in real estate one and uh, the point also on the cost side while the government has been giving liquidity to uh, nbfcs and banks and the liquidity is not ultimately coming to the real estate sector and as a reason we see the pricing for borrowing in real estate remains very very high so how do you see you see that uh, spanning out uh, in in times to come yeah uh, first of all thank you uh, piyush uh, for asking this pertinent question uh, which is very relevant in uh, today's uh, scenario uh liquidity is one thing uh, which everybody uh, all the nbfcs and developers and hfcs are struggling uh, for the past two years uh it is not only post covid that we have encountered this problem but uh, pre covid also and last year also the economy itself was slowing down and uh, the liquidity was becoming an issue uh, with all the stakeholders so i think uh, uh, what happens is that Uh, you will find that this sector was doing pretty good uh, past ten years. If you see in two thousand nine to two thousand nineteen, uh, this sector had attracted institutional investors and uh, you know worth uh, US thirty billion dollars for the last ten years. If you see the last quarter twenty, uh, the investment uh, from institutional investors to the real estate sector is just about seven hundred and twelve million. these figures i have taken from anarok and uh, kpmg and uh, you know their data uh, and uh, i also find that uh, you know in the retail segment uh, it had also attracted uh, p funds and uh, uh, to an extent of us 1 billion in the last year 2019 uh, so these are the funds which came into the sector and uh, you know i i always feel that this sector has got a lot of potential we are looking at this sector with a 13% uh, 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 gdp growth uh, in the year 2025 and this sector is uh, poised to grow at uh, us 1 trillion by 2030 these are the predictions uh, which are there for this sector so the corrections are happening in the sector but then the liquidity problem is one which is faced by each and every person 
so what i feel is uh, that uh, you know uh, the government has done a little bit in giving uh, you know some funds uh, to nhb for refinancing uh, of the 10000 crores which went to uh, to nhb a lot of nbfcs and hfcs were entitled to that refinancing fund uh, so that has been distributed by nhb and we were also uh, uh, party to that and we also received some funds from them but then again you know everybody is towing very cautiously at the moment and in spite of rbi uh, saying the regulator saying that please do not look at the uh, you know the ratings of the nbfcs and please give funds to each and every nbfcs but uh, somewhere down the line the banks are not very comfortable the regulator the refinancing uh, nhb is not very comfortable in going ahead and releasing these funds because they again are looking at their own funds and their own uh, you know uh, way of doing uh, business so um, but i also feel that uh, you know this liquidity problem uh, will lead to consolidation uh, you would know that uh, you know we have uh, builders like in chennai we have uh, uh, shriram uh, properties which we know that is uh, uh, going on uh, making 15000 units as of now but it is not from the base or the scratch that they have started they have now started acquiring the projects which have gone into stressed and they have started to take consolidation into those projects also as compared to the earlier to covid 19 situation the real estate is now moving towards more of consolidation there are a wide ranges changes in the way we do the business the way we are now practicing the business Now, these strategies, the designing, the consumer behavior, which is coming into this, uh, you know, this entire business of real estate. Uh, the the COVID nineteen uh, will break the backbone of lot of, uh, you know, smaller developers, as uh, was being told by Mr. Gitamber that uh, you know, a uh, lot of developers, the small ones, will remain down or either they will not come up. So it is also predicted that you know, thirty percent of these developers may exit. may take the exit route so then what then where does the consumer go where does the borrowers will go so this liquidity problem can be addressed i believe very well as shriram is doing by you know taking over the stressed projects uh, completing them giving the opportunity to the buyers to remain in the market and also uh, you know giving the uh, the the uh, liquid liquidity assets of these builders who have no money no no nothing now to go forward to so this consolidation as per the credai chairman also uh, will be now the in thing in the real estate sector and i hope that this comes in and this takes over and this really uh, becomes the order of the day uh, with the post covid situation and uh, the covid will also bring lot of changes in the way the construction activities were happening in this country i think the product and the planning and uh, the customer behavior which we will see post covid will change the customer today now is uh, you know uh, 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 even the builders i think uh, will now look at providing certain facilities to the customers for example a builder may think of providing you know a a, a real um, a project with a high speed internet this was never thought of by the builders in the past and this will again you know give one industry a boost that will be our uh, mobile phone industries which will also get boosted by this kind of a you know change and behavior and in uh, uh, by the builders in the construction activities and i think uh, this change will bring a welcome change uh, in the industry and uh, these uh, uh, outlook which the industry will now come out with in the post covid 19 situation Uh, will be very positive and things will uh, turn uh, to the advantage of all okay so so what you're saying is the credit will be available to select few and that will lead to consolidation and lot of stress work out so what we are saying is maybe next 9 months 12 months time we are going to see lot of workouts happening in the financial services industry and as well as the developer side right yes. so how do you see the financing on the retail side we have seen now home loans you know uh, going uh, rates going as low as maybe in last we have not seen last 8 10 years yes are uh, uh, hfc is being more stringent on giving housing loans or it will be as flexible do we see more of adf subvention scheme being supported by hfcs will uh, uh, 
uh, when you speak on the subvention scheme, I think there is uh, all, almost a ban by the, uh, the regulator now on those subvention schemes, which were running either 1090 or 2080 schemes earlier. Uh, even with the, with, with the ADRs, which will be advanced uh, uh, disbursement facility, which was available earlier to the borrowers, and borrower would, we would simply give the entire money to the developer and the borrower's EMI would start immediately, whether there was a delay to the project or not, uh, the, uh, the, the borrower would be affected if he was in a pre-EMI condition, not in an EMI condition. So uh, I think that uh, we, the industry can think of starting this ADRs, which will help uh, both uh, the borrower as well as uh, you know, the developer in the long run. Because uh, if we stop these practices which were there earlier, why I say this is because, uh, see, this industry is almost getting regulated in the sense that now we have the RERA, which is being implemented by most of the states. So we know that these projects are on. We know that these projects are going to be over within this period of time. So there are regulations which have been put into the projects. And, uh, uh, you know, nobody is now taking you for a ride if you go through the right projects through the RERA and through other things. So why not? We can, again, think of starting these ADRs and... Uh, and uh, look at, uh, you know, uh, again, kind of a finance to the developer for completing his projects and getting more uh, people into his projects. So uh, uh, I am I am for, uh, you know, uh, uh, but in the long run, in some cases, the ADR doesn't work in the sense that, you know, um, if the construction uh, does not uh, uh, happen uh, in the time frame or it takes a longer period of time, then uh, the uh, borrower thinks that he's taken for a ride in these kind of ADR situations. But as far as uh, regulator is concerned, now we have to pay to the developer on the, you know, the, the, the construction uh, completion certifications that how much is the percentage of com construction completed, then we go on paying him. Circumvention schemes have already been stopped. Uh, a lot of HFCs have faced the problems from a lot of developers who were in the pre-EMI stages who have not been able to deliver the projects and who have not been able to, again, sell more of the, you know, the project because they have just uh, found themselves short of the finances. So um, I feel that, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in the current scenario, uh, as far as SFCs are concerned, we are also cautiously trading ourselves in the sense that you know, we, we can give liquidity. Liquidity is available now to the borrower at around 7 to 7.5% of rate of interest. The, uh, you know, the lockdown has come as a watershed moment for the uh, uh, many tenants to think that let us now own a house rather than living in a, you know, in a um, rental property because uh, the, uh, the rents are going very high and there are no returns on these rental properties. So that is one aspect which has come into uh, the minds of the people during this pandemic. And I think it is a very good sign. Secondly, we also find that uh, uh, it is a matter of wonder as to how within these last two, three months, a lot of people have bought houses online. So are we moving towards that direction? Uh, you know, that, uh, th that we had never seen that houses being sold via online uh, platforms in the uh, in the past so this is one thing where i am looking at i am also interested in doing it um, uh, and why not like when everything is available online then why not uh, we sell uh, uh, you know the properties online and we we take the we cater to the customers online uh, of course this will be a challenge for the developers they will have to build a lot of platforms for this they will have to go virtual so there are developers who take you to the virtual sites, to their uh, sites. And uh, I mean, there is nothing that a digital platform cannot offer today to a borrower or to a, to a customer. So I think uh, by, by looking into all this, uh, giving a finance uh, in today's situation to the borrowers should not be an issue. And borrowers buying properties as their first properties, we will see that there will be a surge in this the, uh, the borrowers who had not brought properties earlier, uh, they are contemplating buying post-COVID-19 uh, because they have now realized that buying a property is cheaper. If you look at the EMIs today, they will be 30% less than the EMI being paid by a borrower two years back. 
so why not this is the real opportunity for a borrower to come into this real estate and buy buy the houses Right. Yeah. So, so Gitamba, just taking on that point, you now are you seeing any such trends? Okay, we spoke about online sales. Now, any change in customer preferences? Uh, whether you now moving more from leasing to buying, is this happening, or in terms of preference of size of apartments, luxury to affordable to mid? So, any kind of trends we see in last three or four months emerging, which possibly we say setting the you know story forward. Good. of course you know what uh, neera says is absolutely right and i said this in the first webinar we had at tiki whoever you know rental housing co living and shared living these are things of the past hmm. Hmm. after the corona problem everybody has realized ke kuch nahi kuch nahi to ghar apna hona chahiye hamare paas like i said you see the problem today is you see affordability sabki alag alag hai so aspiration hai ke i must have a bigger house with a store and with a office and it's up to us now but project which are already under construction you can't change the design today mm-hmm. so there is a profe- so affordability is the key word today so affordable housing and we have a separate company that does affordable housing and uh, yeah. Rooms, uh, hdfc has a stake in that so our affordable housing is doing it and fortunately mm-hmm. because we are working a lot in noida so most of our housing is mm-hmm. considered affordable mm-hmm. affordable and mm-hmm. depending on you know the deepak parak committee's recommendation for time, times your gross annual income us hisab se affordable is what we are doing but yes the basic problem is that in spite of the aspiration of owning your own house today post covid is very strong and of course uh, through the internet and online purchases the inquiries have increased problem is that you know the sectors who were our customers mm-hmm. airline industry mm-hmm. hotel industry mm-hmm. travel tourism industry auto mm-hmm. industry they are in stress so the person who's our buyer is working in these industries yeah and mm-hmm. that person today says you know i don't know how much of a pay cut i'll be taking in the next one year i don't know whether i'll have my job or not in the you know because things are jobs have been lost let's not forget that mm-hmm. so if you know we have to be innovative i would say as developers so like very rightly neera you said you know the regulator has banned subvention schemes but if the rbi and we pushed it very strongly in the finance ministry that you know if you can recommend to the rbi to come up with a scheme wherein my customer has he intent to buy they have a deposit to put up pehle 20% tha let them put up a 30% or a 25% let them pay their first two years interest not the emi interest from that extra 5% because interest rates have come down a lot if you are doing a pmay purchase then the uh, npv of your uh, subsidy is about 2.4 lakhs for a three bedroom house also so effectively the interest is very less so if that 5% extra that they are putting up as a deposit can look after the interest payment for the first 24 months because 24 months hence mm. everything is going to be stable because if it's not mm. stable after 24 months it will never be stable the economy yeah. will never come on track mm. so i am saying give a window of 24 months to my buyer mm. from the hfc let the hfc take only interest from their deposit and then refi the interest payment in the 24th month because maybe they take a interest uh, 10% of the deposit is used as interest payment maybe depending on the size of the loan refi that 10% or 5% in the 24th month hmm. and by that time my home buyer will have a secure job and a secure pay scale so if something innovative like this is done and finance ministry has taken note of that they asked us for a note so we will give them a very uh, you know uh, detailed note on that so if something like that happens so there is an intent to buy there is an aspiration to buy but there is a lack of confidence to buy yes. to hmm. so if hmm. that is addressed then we have a story yeah. immediately and i am telling you this what neera said i am totally with her Hmm. In the thirteen percent today, real estate contributes to six to seven percent of the GDP. Hmm. We have the capacity with the aspiration. So the fastest comeback kid in entire businesses, entire canvas of businesses will be real estate, hmm. because for one year nobody is going on a holiday, for one year nobody is going to travel unless necessary. Hmm. So hmm. one year nobody is going to stay in a hotel, but for one year people want to buy that house. My house, yeah. So we are the hmm. fastest comeback hmm. kid, and we should be, hmm. you know. the mm-hmm. government should use this opportunity to kick start the economy by kick starting real estate so these small small things they are listening to mm-hmm. the good news is they are asking for suggestions and what more should be done tell us so mm-hmm. we are in continuous dialogue with them and i am sure something will evolve soon we are waiting for the uh, rbi policy i think in august we, first week of august we are going to have some good announcements mm-hmm. so we are all very hopeful mm-hmm. yeah. god willing mm-hmm. 
yeah no yeah hopefully i think we will have something positive on this from the government so we spoke about consolidation and sanjay you know coming to you now in the current situation uh, would you be in the market now to acquire new properties right there are a lot of workouts happening with lenders uh, bankers so one is what kind of asset classes uh, would you want to prefer at this point of time right resi has been area forte but would you want to venture in something like industrials logistics right and will you be aggressive also in residential because you will find a lot of opportunities uh, at this point of time coming from your fellow developers also from the lenders uh so piyush we already have a strategy in place which we rolled out about 2 years ago hmm. so we have uh, close to 20 projects of which 17 are residential so and and we have another 30 to 40 million square feet under residential to develop so they are at various stages of planning and developing so one strategy we have rolled out is that we want to be in the city hmm. so some of our new announcements of projects Mm-hmm. we last year we did sector 150 and alipur calcutta launch uh, mm-hmm. in the by the end of this year in mumbai there'll be three launches mm-hmm. chembur andheri and mulund mm-hmm. uh, so they are more inside the city than outer periphery which we already have a large portfolio under tata value homes affordable segment so there is no generally there is no need to grow this portfolio beyond 30 to 40 million square feet is already too much mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh we have a 6 million square feet of commercial which we felt we should grow so we have 14 million square feet that we can construct under commercial in addition to 6 million which is generating income rental income for us so we'll be about 20 million in commercial after we develop the whole we have signed up four term sheets for new land parcels in top 3 or 4 cities which will give us a potential of another 20 22 million square feet taking our commercial also to 40 million square feet portfolio so we see great value in the market and therefore it's the topic for our discussion can we really unlock the value the answer is yes uh, and and we've been looking at it are we going to go overboard the answer is no uh, perhaps earlier we went in too many cities and states now the focus is top 5 or 6 cities only which we have been maintaining for last 2 years and that is our forte that is where we want to build our business and our focus would also be across affordable mid and a lot of commercial in the commercial space we actually recently uh, got another commitment of pre lease built to suit commitment of data center uh, that is one segment we are looking at very aggressively uh so b2b formats like data centers like office corporate office it park will be our focus area and uh in the times to come we we can look at industrial and warehousing but there is no need we already have too much to develop for now right and to uh, and this uh, question is both to sanjay and gitama before we go back to you know venamra how are the investors now looking uh, you know when looking at a portfolio you know the there was there has been a bias against residential in last uh, you know 5 6 years where all the capital has moved in commercial and obviously to warehousing in in some data centers is the trend likely to continue and it, it may further negate towards residential or we think some balancing may happen uh towards residential i can take a quick uh, answer on this i think commercial has a natural advantage of no development risk mm. it's a income producing mm. so institutional capital seeking zero development risk zero leasing marketing risk uh long term you know patient capital will go into reits and office rental it's a no brainer and i think the answer lies in uh, compressing yields that we have seen in last 3 to 4 years uh, you know earlier they were very high now they are increasingly coming down so there is a negative spread between borrowing and the yield that you uh, are getting in the market so that is clearly an indicator that commercial will continue to play a very important role next 2 to 3 years i think there is an opportunity i know there is another uh, a singaporean company called capital land which had exited india at one time they are back yeah in residential yeah. i know there is still a lot of private equity 
Japanese um, funds. We saw one Japanese deal closing so, in first quarter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> lot of lot of uh, private equity and fund managers, local, who've been there. They understand the market. They have uh, kind of filtered the tier one developers who have tr successful track record and better understanding and better organization structure. They are chasing those relationships. In fact, many of them may even go for platform level. Uh, discussions. So I think the area will remain exciting. It's just that it will be consolidated. In, in, in every market, there'll be top five or six players and not hundreds and thousands that we saw in the past. Okay. Right. Gitamar, any your, your view on this? Yeah. You're on mute. You're on mute. So my personal view is you see, housing is the foundation of real estate. Hmm. And it will always be, you know, that uh, the tortoise and the frog story. So ho housing is the tortoise, is the kachua. It keeps <laughs> plodding, plodding. And the best thing is that there's a huge demand of housing in this country. Huge. Mm -hmm. And today also we need about 10 million units in the urban areas and 40 million units in tier 2, tier 3 cities. As an organization, ATS is now venturing into tier 3, tier 4 towns also. And we are doing affordable housing. We are doing mm -hmm. mid-income housing. We are doing high-end, very small housing. A very small part of high-end housing. But, and I've seen this cycle, you know, the housing thing keeps plodding, 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 commercial like that, then then again up, then again down. So it, I'm not saying anything against commercial. We are also doing commercial. But I think the stability of uh, real estate comes from housing. And because the country has a solid actual demand for housing, and the government understands that there is a huge opportunity in housing. So you see the policy for housing, you see PMAY, you see uh, the, now the rental uh, affordable rental housing complex policy they were just announced for, for migrant labor and all. So there's a huge opportunity. And I would say, look at the pyramid of demand in housing. The base has got so much meat. And when we have gone to smaller towns, we realized there's so much of meat over there. What will happen is, like uh, Neera also said, and I think uh, Vinamra also said, and Sanjay also pointed out, consolidation is going to be key, and it's happening. So you'll see very shortly, you'll see the good players in each geography actually not partnering, but actually helping out the smaller players who are stressed. So there'll be a big, big boat. And mm -hmm. in our organization, we made a new company, which actually takes up stall projects. Neera, I must tell you. We call it ATS Nirman. We've already got yeah. two in the in the kitty and we're looking mm -hmm. at more. Mm -hmm. So this consolidation will co give comfort to the private equity players. And we are not looking so much at debt. We are looking now at a platform level deal. Where we've done one platform level deal in the affordable housing sector. Now we are looking at a platform level deal for stressed assets. Because there are some uh, 5 lakh uh, uh, crore worth of units in the country which are stalled. That's what the latest uh, figure said the other day. So if we can set up a successful, why if we've already set it up and if we can get a good private equity player who it's a very, uh, you know, asset light, uh, lightly uh, capitalized model. So we are trying to put together a structure wherein a stall project can actually be turned around. And this is a five to seven year play with the kind of stall projects which we see today. So there's enough opportunity in housing, mm. greenfield and brownfield. So if mm. somebody can crack both, Hmm. I think there's a valuation game here. Right. And the similar, you see, uh, yeah. hmm. sorry. No, sorry, no. sorry, go ahead. Completely, no. sorry. So, so like, you know, we are looking at a valuation in commercial real estate. Hmm. So now we have started looking at a valuation in the residential hmm. real estate. Pay. So when we talk of a platform deal, we always actually eventually look at a valuation. So, so be it a stressed asset play, be it greenfield housing, which is affordable and, uh, you know, mid-income housing. Going forward, consolidation, platform level, and you'll have juggernauts and big guys in each geography who are doing this play. Consolidation will happen, and maybe the so what I've seen in Noida and Gurga and NCR, the smaller players are saying, okay, let's have a model where we still are, you know, fixing the nuts and bolts in the stall project. You get in, give give the lender comfort to give money capital to this. You control the money. We will not take out a single rupee. We mm -hmm. only want to get free of RERA. We want to get free of the customer responsibility. We want to complete the project. Even if it's, if we don't make any money, money, mm -hmm. even if we have to pay something equity out of pocket, but we don't want to have the burden of an incomplete project. So right, that is right. good news. 
So this mm. model is emerging in most geographies, and mm. I see this going forward. Brownfield housing or stall projects, as we see it, it's a huge opportunity, and it'll take at least five to seven years to do that. Greenfield yeah. will continue, and 40 million houses in tier three, tier four towns. So we have done mm. three such complexes with a thousand units. The concept over there is not high rise. We've done a project in Bulandshahar, which is close to BNCR. We've done one in Bareilly. We've done one in Muradabad. So it is a concept of Mary's Amin, Mera Asman. They will, they want to own a house which is expandable because they don't want to go to a high-rise community where you know when when son gets married, then they have to buy another apartment. Other one gets married, they have to buy another part. They want a concept where one son gets married, I put another floor on top. Next one gets married, I put another. So it's an expandable concept. It's doing very well, yeah. and all three of our projects have seen traction over there. So we are looking at this opportunity in a big way. Plus, we are also looking at uh, office spaces. There's Sanjay and uh, Vinamra on the panel, so I want to tell them that we are looking at office spaces, and we have some very good assets lined up, which I think Capital Land say. So we've already shown some assets to you all. So it's not that I'm right saying that it's just real estate, but real uh, sorry, just residential. But residential historically. Has been the foundation of real estate place. This is what I personally feel. Yeah. So and the good thing which you said is, you know, the equity may come back. I think so. Yeah. What was lacking in the developers was equity. You know, everyone kind of played with more leverage. Leverage. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So uh, great. So Vinamra, uh, you know, uh, coming to you now. Uh, is there any change, you know, from the international uh, developers or the institutional players to how they looked at commercial? Now, uh, uh, developers like you all, you all were looking at development risk. Also, you know, in commercial, will that uh, strategy continue, or uh, you think that may possibly misplace for you know for a few months to come? And within the different markets, uh, you know, you've been focusing on. Will you be more selective now in choosing what you want to do? See, uh, Piyush, for the first question, uh, there are two types of foreign investors in this country as far as commercial real estate is concerned. One is the ones who are uh, developers on their own. Right, uh, and there are others who are pure sovereign wealth funds or private equities who partner with developers. Right? Both of them have exposure to uh, greenfield development. Uh, our sense is that pretty much all of them will continue their development. Uh, uh, all the projects that are under construction are going to continue. It's same for us. We've got projects under construction in in all the six tier one cities that we are in, and they are all going to continue. And we even continue to look at new investments as well. And I'm quite sure. Uh, i speak on behalf of most of my peers uh, in those foreign investor companies as well and the reason for that was already mentioned earlier as well that uh, uh, commercial has been a stable asset once it achieves uh, stability because of the recurring income nature right uh, reits have only reinforced that idea because dividend yields will continue to drive investors i hope they reduce the lot size so more and more retail investors can start participating as well so so i think in the long term uh, i don't see much change in strategy from foreign investors and if you look at the other asset classes of real estate uh, uh, the two which will continue to gain traction are logistics and data center logistics already is quite crowded now uh data centers uh, uh, sanjay earlier mentioned we are very close to you know completing our deals as well there uh, so i will expect more and more from data centers as well so for foreign investors i think all these three sectors commercial warehousing and data centers will continue to be extremely lucrative having said that right now at least in the next one year and and i talk to a lot of um, investors outside india because we are headquartered in singapore as you know so we engage a lot with investors in southeast asia Uh, and a lot of money that flows into india channels through singapore uh and there i do see some skepticism at least in the short term because for a foreign investor he has now options to look at india greenfield as a target asset class versus a western market stabilized asset as a target asset class what has been happening is that the india greenfield story now is coming with an additional risk at least for the short term so what they are saying is that you know if if i was looking for at least a 17 18% irr equity irr earlier now i'm looking at 21 22% uh unfortunately the stress of the market hasn't really translated to asset pricing as yet yeah. mm-hmm. i think it will happen i think it's a bit too soon typically there is a lag uh, of 4 to 6 months before finally land on a say okay you know what yeah it's not selling i need to come down on my mm-hmm. expectations Mm-hmm. and a lot of foreign investors are sitting on a lot of dry powder to wait for that price corrections to happen but till those price corrections don't happen mm-hmm. investor irr expectation has increased pricing had not reduced 
and that is why uh, i do see that there will be very cautious approach to investing in greenfield projects in india at least till that correction happens and there is a parity between return expectation because the risks have increased but you are able to deliver this return because your entry prices have gone down yeah once that balance happens then i think there will be normal which mm. was happening for the last 5 6 years with the yeah. commercial boom mm. this year i think or this year when i say this year probably one year from now uh will be that time period where this imbalance will remain to a certain extent right mm. uh so so that's what we are seeing as far as the investor sentiment is concerned and honestly speaking uh, you know today even the western uh, stabilized markets are giving you uh, good returns uh, 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 e- even to to the extent of you know 6 to 7% yeah. dollar mm. dollar mm. returns right yes. you add another 5 6% rupee that's like 12 to 13% at yes. a uh, mm. rupee level uh, risk mm. free that is pretty mm. good for a yes. lot of investors mm. so they are mm. saying i would rather park my money in a stabilized building in singapore or london than search for this 20% in india which mm. i hope i mm. get it but the risks are just mm. too high Right. that's what's going on in their mind as of mm. now but i'm mm. pretty sure it will change as time period evolves mm. quickly to your next question of locations uh, unfortunately i think for india commercial story it is the the top 6 cities or maybe top 7 cities that have continued to gather 80 85% of the grade a occupier demand and and we are continuing to see the same story the tier 1 cities the top 6 to 7 are continuing to increase in consecutive circles so you know uh, bangalore today is still over rr now it's slowly going to north bangalore so it to the airport same with gurgaon same with hyderabad but what's not yet happening is um, uh, uh, the foreign company saying okay i am willing to open up a new campus in a mysore or a mohali or a lucknow hmm. i wish that happens because that's far more sustainable for the whole urban development story for india but unfortunately that's not yet happening and which is why most commercial developers and foreign money will continue to look at these uh, these uh, six or seven tier one cities uh, the same as us as well so we will continue to focus on these only for the commercial sector logistics is a different story because it's driven by the supply chain network and the hub and spoke model so logistics will see more foreign capital coming in into mm-hmm. these cities because they are hubs and nodes to to cater to the entire state from a demography perspective but for commercial we will continue to look at only these six and and that's pretty much where most of the money will continue to go into at least in the short term okay and uh, just follow on uh, to this even uh, within large cities do you think focus uh, slightly may move from uh, cbd to sbds uh, because of the higher pricing in the cbds pure shit was already happening right you are in the segment you mm-hmm. would also know that this was already happening in most of the cities so for every uh, you know mind boggling transaction that happens in a bkc mm-hmm. there are 15 other transactions that do not make the headlines that mm-hmm. happen uh in the western and eastern suburbs mm. of mumbai right mm. so that shift was already happening because a lot of occupiers are getting very conscious uh, uh on the price front at the same time getting more sophisticated on the expectation of quality right so a lot mm. of developers are now able to provide uh the grade a specs that the occupiers require but not in the cbd because then the math doesn't work because the cbd land price itself are too high and the occupiers are actually okay to go to sbds or pbds especially with the way metro networks are progressing everywhere so um, and i think that trend will continue to happen uh, pre covid even post covid where uh, all these three locations cbd pbd sbd will have a specific type of customer set that would want to come there you know uh, 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 a high tech uh, uh, foreign mnc or a foreign investment bank wanting a, a a sleek front office will always want to be in that bkc right uh, but uh, but a captive uh, doing r&d for its tech is okay to pay 30 rupees lower and go to an sbd so it's mm-hmm. horses for courses i think there will be good demand for all the sectors it is about how people position their offerings okay thanks uh, i think we can just uh, take a few you know audience questions uh, uh, so uh, Uh, i think in audience you know people can please raise hands and you know we can take up the question with the panelist sachin you are coordinating with the uh, delegates yeah uh... so we have one question from uh, pradeep kumar Yes, we can hear you. Yes, Pradeep, please go. Good evening, everyone. Myself, Pradeep Kumar. 
sir. I want to know about the land planning policy of Delhi and when it will take some pace. Are you getting? Yeah, I think it's uh, Gitamar. It's probably more relevant for you. Uh, yeah. Land policy yeah. <laughs> so, Radhi, the land pooling policy has already been announced, and as far as when you know, it, uh, it is a very progressive policy. But as far as it's getting paid, you see, the problem is whenever somebody has to pool their land, and more so here in the NCR, and when you tell a farmer, "Give me your land, and I'll give it back to you." After five years, once development is done, and I'll give you FSNI. Farmer, most of them may understand it, but बहुत से ऐसे लोग होते हैं जो कहते हैं नहीं हमको नहीं समझ आता ये. Why don't you just buy my land? So in such a huge, it's twenty-five thousand hectares that is being pulled in. You cannot assume that all hundred percent farmers will say, okay, let's go and do land pooling. Why? Because in the process of land pooling, you don't your land you are just giving away, but you are getting a document for that. And then that document says that after so many years when it's developed, you'll get 60% of your land or 70% developed land. Some may believe it. Some may say, "Fine, this is a good thing. I'll do it." But most of them, who are mule kisan, they say, "No, nah, you know, this kagaz ka mein kya karunga? Kal ko if I something happens to me, my kids will just have this." So that conviction in them is a little difficult to actually uh, operate. So that is why you cannot give a timeline as to when this will be completed. The policy from their side, the government has given a bit. There any chance, any chance for the investment here or stay aside from it? Ah, uh, if you are a land aggregator, I would say, hang on, <laughs> wait. <laughs> no uh, time limit to wait. <laughs> So, there are so many other opportunities. Look, we were talking on this panel. There are so many other opportunities. Is the time for buying land? I think is gone because you cannot speculate on land now. There has been so much uncertainty, and it's not going to end in a hurry. So, I would not advise you to speculate on land just to make money. Uh, any any more questions from the audience? Second. Second, second actually, question is from Abhinav Gard. Abhinav, Sajin, move to the next one. I think Abhinav is here now. Okay. I think there is some time lag. Apologies for that. Uh, so my question was: We were talking a lot about uh, the commercial space being, uh, you know, substantially stable. Uh, we were focusing on offices, data centers, which are actually uh, creating demand, and we are moving forward. How about uh, the retail segment or the commercial complex segment of it? Do we also see uh, a similar uh, a positive sentiment, or is it the other way around? Sanjay, you want to? No, I think uh, in the in the commercial real estate space, we've seen a specialization. There are developers who are focused on office. There are developers who are focused on office and industrial warehousing, and there are developers who continue to thrive and excel in retail. And many have exited. So just the way office was ten years ago, that's where the retail is. There is a consolidation happening, and the two top three or four players are creating a large portfolio by acquiring existing portfolio with the intent of doing a REIT. Uh, or indeed building a large uh, platform so i think that will in the short term will have is as you know is severely hit uh, but uh, i have no doubt that these strong ones will take advantage of the current market situation in scale and there is a lot of patient capital available for them so there are enough sovereigns who are very keen to fund these platforms great uh Uh, do we have time for uh, more questions neerja sachin uh, one or two sachin if somebody is waiting or is yeah mithilesh is there mithilesh and then we ask gitambar ji to conclude the session yeah. so, uh, i have a question so good evening mithilesh gokani and i am the founder of a prop platform called ghas.com i hope to me sir yes please it's good <laughs> Yes, sir. So I want to pose COVID is the important how relevant is like you know prop tech because it was not that ten people had this trust 
we would develop but now post covid people can't do sites people want to do the discovery center home and hopefully even trans how this uh, electric industry now so not followed the full question but i think the role of ah. tech is uh, increasing i think neera said it very well that uh, developers are already gearing up uh, across all stages of transactions and customer journey in fact in the commercial real estate it is beyond just leasing it is everything and i think even in the design and construction uh, the role of prop tech is actually all time high uh, we've actually allocated considerable amount of investment and capital to see uh, that we bring in even machine learning artificial intelligence into the modeling and data analytics to enable quicker and better marketing strategies to promote the parks uh, or indeed residential projects so all that is very high in my opinion yes. so so as co-founder i think i will be positive now for the invest to come in prop tech industry no absolutely Thank you, thank you, thanks a lot. With that, Sachin, uh, we yeah, I have leave it to the moderator to invite Mr. Uh, Gitambaranand to conclude the session. I have a question here. Yeah. I'm Tiagarajan. Sure. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is regarding the commercial office space demand. As I understand from based on today's conversation, a lot of optimism in terms of the push to that commercial development. But based on that market study and survey, what we understand is there is likely to be 30% reduction in terms of the commercial space requirement, as well as uh, this is mainly due to the post-COVID de-densification and also the success of the working from home. So somehow I see some kind of uh, uh, contradiction into what we studied and what that industry perceives. Uh, could any one of you can just uh, know, clarify I'll, that? What is that? I'll, I'll, uh, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. So what you're seeing in the reports currently is, is not a, a factor of long-term changes. The, what the numbers that we're seeing in the quarter one or the half year one is a reflection of the lockdown. Uh, nobody could travel. Uh, commercial rental dis decisions happen significantly when the ultimate decision maker travels down to the site, etc. None of that was happening. So the drop that you're seeing 30 40 50 percent uh, in this half is a function of that and even we are expected to end the year somewhere around at least you know 40 or maybe even 50 percent down from last year and all of that will be a significant driver of uh, of the lockdown situation in the mid or the long run uh, there are two counter forces at play one is the fact that there is work from home which how successful will it be it will be known um, not now, but in a longer period of time. Right now, there was no option, so everybody had to be at home. Tomorrow, when there is an option with the challenges of infrastructure, tech, etc., it remains to be seen on what is that percentage of work from home that will stabilize. It is expected that that percentage will be higher than what it was pre-COVID. Having said that, the other counter force is the fact that Due to social distancing, there will be different designs which will require more spaces. Due to BCP purposes, there may be need not to put all space in one building, but uh, expand, etc. Uh, and the pie continues to grow bigger because India's attractiveness as a high quality tech destination with cost arbitrage will only get better. So when you put all of these things together, right now the sense in the market is that uh, it doesn't seem that all of this together is going to impact the amount of real estate or office space uh, and and even if it does to what extent uh, it is still uh, uh, you know time will tell so uh, the sense from all occupiers and developers right now is that this will even out and the basic drivers of growth of the need for office space will still continue to be there uh, the way this happens the way offices get designed invested in yes will definitely change in the post covid era but there is no one-to-one -one correlation that the amount of space itself will go down. Yeah. Also, and, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to add quickly, Vinamra. I think a lot of people are comparing commercial to residential. So unlike residential, where there was a lot of excessive supply in commercial, there is no excessive supply. Or more importantly, relevant supply. So a lot of commercial developments may have been built, but the key locations if you see across the country where there is maximum demand, the vacancy is single digit three to 4% or 5%.
uh, while as a city it may be 18%, 14%, which means a lot of commercial got built in wrong places. Uh, the second aspect is even in global financial crisis, when the world took a hit, uh, we had 35 million square feet absorption in 2008, which came down to 19 million square feet in next following two years. Yes, short term setback is huge, but it started to come back and reach 47 million square feet from 19 million in 2008 to 2019, 47 million square feet net absorption. So maybe this year we will touch 19 to 20 and maybe it will remain so like Vinamra said for another year or so, but gradually it will come back. And if if globally, if organizations are want to optimize their costs, they want to outsource more, the natural gain is for the country. Uh, and, and I've said it in many webinars, Residential is linked to domestic consumption. Office market is linked to global consumption. So that one more distinction uh, that we have in comparison to residential. Thank you, Mr. Sanjay, and thank you, Vinamara. Great. Uh, if there are any more questions, we'll be happy to take them offline and send it to the respective speakers. In the interest of time, may I invite our office bearer, our co-chairman, uh, real estate sector, Mr. Gitamar Anand, to please give us concluding remarks. Thank you, Nija. Thank you so much. So what has emerged, I think, from this discussion is that real estate is one of the safest asset classes. Gold is too expensive now, and real estate, they say, though the prices are not decreasing, but then it's at a good price and a good time to invest. So uh, having said that, let's be realistic. It's not time to celebrate just yet because the COVID scenario is not yet over. I think we are yet to see the worst effect of COVID, and I think July, August, months which are because of the humidity there will be some more disruptions is what we feel so but yes in the long run absolutely safe absolutely strong and one must have their own house to live in is something that we have been advocating and uh, oh we lost him yeah we but lost. i think uh, mr gitaman anand summarized very well so let's not uh, you know prematurely celebrate because there is still stress and there is still a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I, I have no doubt that if you're a medium to long-term player in real estate, you will only see the unlocking potential in the country far more than the concerns. So it's an opportunity for developers who have access to capital, have demonstrated success to take advantage of this and therefore leapfrog their businesses in India. Thank you very much uh, for everybody's participation. Thank you. Uh, Nirja, thank you for your right. Thank you, thank sir. You, thank on that positive thank note, you. I thank all the speakers for being with us today. Thank you very much for joining us, delegates. Thank you. Until thank we see you. you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.